um, talk a little bit more about that next week when we go back and characterize matrices as representing functions from vector space to vector space. Um, remember that when we're talking about vector spaces, we're generally talking about Rn. Um, R3, R2, R1, these are all examples of vector spaces, which I think are familiar to us. So that's sort of the nature of the conversation right now. Um, one reason, so we'll, I'll give you the definition of a basis, the, the, the strict definition of a basis in just a second, but you know, kind of, we've already talked around it a lot, so it will be kind of unsurprising. Um, but one reason why you want to know a little bit about a basis is, is it has to do with associating an, an, an invariant to a vector space, um, which is compatible with people's notion of dimension. Um, so the notion of dimension within, within something like R3 is, is pretty natural for most people. When people talk about R3, they're typically thinking about three-dimensional space. And the, and the reason why people would think that is that, you know, you have the X, the Y, and the Z um, you know, coordinate axes. You have three numbers which serve to describe a point in that space. Um, when people think about R2, they tend to think about two-dimensional space. Um, if you, you know, lots of times people have to consider higher dimensional spaces like Rn, they're going to typically think about the dimension of such a space as being as being n, because you're thinking that you have n different coordinate axes, n different axes which are necessary to somehow describe the position of a point in that space. So there's some geometric idea about what dimension ought to be, and you know for us we want you know the goal is to try to come up with with a, with a completely algebraic characterization of the same thing, um, which is consistent with that geometric intuition and. The idea of a basis is basically what serves that purpose. Um, the difficulty with bases, and people pointed this out after class, and they're absolutely right. We were talking a little about the column space of, of the matrix toward the end of yesterday, is that a basis is not unique. Um, so if it were true that the only basis for uh, R3 was 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, there'd be very little to talk about. But the problem is the, the problem, but maybe it's not really a problem, it's actually kind of a virtue, I think, of, 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 of the subject, is that there is more than one way of writing down a basis for a vector space. But of interest here is, is that bases, the bases that you might write down for a given vector space all have one thing in common. They have the same number of elements contained within them. So the one thing, the one invariant of a vector space that we want to describe is its dimension and we will come to describe the dimension of a vector space as the number of elements that are contained within any basis of that vector space. Um, it's kind of where the conversation is right now. Um, we're still at the point where we're doing calculations. Toward the end of today, um, I want to give an argument um, that um, any two bases that you can write down for the same vector space have the same number of elements. But in preparation for that argument, it probably will probably well serve to do a few calculations first. Um, so here, here is, you know, here, here are the technical terms that we kind of need to talk about. So one thing, um, you know, the first thing that we might talk about is this concept of a spanning set. So a set of vectors V1 up to say VR is said to span a vector space V provided that any vector, put a little arrow above that V, any vector V and V can be written as a linear combination of those vectors. Now, linear combination means what you think it does. It means that we're sort of saying that if it turns out that any element in our vector space V has a decomposition into something that looks like this, we're saying that those vectors span the vector space V. Um, we already have some examples of something like this. Um, I'd like to give you a couple of exercises to do, maybe to generate a couple or more. Um, one example we have, um, you know, the column space of the, the column vectors of the matrix span the column space of the matrix by definition. Um, the standard coordinate vectors in R3 span R3. By that I mean 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, it's a 1, um, 0, 0, 1. Um, those three vectors span R3. Um, there are many other examples. We've also talked, uh, in fact, we spent quite a bit of time talking about a set of vectors that span the null space of, of a matrix. And in fact, a lot of the discussion around solving systems of equations is basically talking around that particular issue over and over again, where you can write down a set of vectors which span the null space. In other words, you know, when you're parameterizing the set of solutions to a certain set of equations, 
it turns out that, that, that what you're doing is exactly the same thing as writing a basis down for the null space of a particular matrix. It's the same basic idea. You know, we, we need to try to explain maybe early next week why exactly that works. Um, we could have described it, I think, in week one, but I wanted to put that question aside to we, we talked a little about matrices, in particular, a little bit about elementary matrices. Um, so before we get too far into discussions of basis and span and dimension, a couple of exercises for people to do early on just to get warmed up a bit. Um, when you're talking about, well, before we do that, when you're talking about a spanning set, um, practically, a set of vectors, V1, V2, and so on, VR, span R, or span V, if the matrix, or if you can solve If you can solve the equation, so I'll use this notation again later today, um, but I'm gonna, the notation that you're seeing here is meant to represent say we don't really know what VR, VR is, but let's write this as V1 say up to Bn. So we don't necessarily know that R and N are the same. If you can solve this for any vector B, it's Bn, so it is Br, well, in the V. Um, so, you know, you're basically, you're basically asserting that any vector can be written as some kind of linear combination of the vectors within the spanning set. Um, luckily, you already have a, you've already, you've all already done a problem, which, which is quite a bit like addressing this question. That problem was problem two on written assignment one. If you go back to problem two on written assignment one, if you remember what it is that you're actually doing, um, it's equivalent to solving an equation like the one I just wrote, or at least trying to write down the set of vectors for which there is a solution to such an equation. Um, in the language that we are using right now to try to describe the idea of a spanning set, the content of problem two on written assignment one is or would have been or is for you to describe um, the set of vectors spanned by the column of the coefficient matrix in that problem. Um, so I've got that coefficient matrix written down here somewhere, you know, we'll probably do that problem later today. But in a sense, you've already kind of addressed this sort of question, so, but maybe in a different language. So when you're talking about uh, problem two on written assignment one, the way that problem was cast in that assignment, um, you were just looking for a collection of vectors that could be solved for. A more elegant description is, is that you're basically looking for, you're basically looking for what set of vectors are spanned by the columns of the coefficient matrix in problem two. It's the same problem. Um, so that's that's kind of how you would show that something is a spanning set, or that's how you would show that something was in the span of the collection of vectors. It really just amounts to trying to solve some equations. It's the same thing as solving some kind of equation involving matrices. And you already are pretty, pretty, pretty well equipped to do that. Um, and so with that in mind, I'd like people to do a couple of exercises before we begin, just two, then we'll talk about them. So show that the vectors one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one. So that's a set of vectors span R3. Now remember, this amounts to showing that any vector in R3 can be written as a linear combination of those vectors. Um, but as a second problem, show that the vectors one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, two, 
span R3. Um, so, you know, just a couple of exercises. The first one will probably not take too long. Um, the second one might take a little bit longer. Maybe think through um, what you did on, on exercise on exercise two on the written assignment. And then maybe think a little bit about how, how you would recast that problem in the language of solving some equations. Um, it's about 10 13. Let's take about five, six, seven minutes to maybe address both of those, and we'll come back and discuss. Um, I'll turn off my video right now, stop the recording. About 10 20, we'll reconvene. Um, I'll post or I'll put the problem. All right, so let's get back to it. Look um, to see whether or not we're dealing with actual spanning sets. Um, the first problem um, is pretty straightforward, I think, um, showing that that set of vectors spans R3. Um, you're just trying to show that any vector, so we need, we need to show that any vector in R3 can be written as a linear combination of those three vectors. So I'll just write them as a set. One, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one. So let V be in R3. We might write V down as V1, V2, V3, just a, just a column vector. Um, to be able to show, because of the way matrix multiplication for us is defined, to be able to show that this fact is true, it, it amounts to showing We need to show that the equation is one zero 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 one zero 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 one. Um, I'll go ahead and write this as C one, C two, C three. Put the V one, V two, V three as a solution. C1, C2, C3 for each vector V. Um, now, when, when, you're, when you're trying to figure out or you're trying to show that, that this thing has a solution vector for each vector V, um, what most people are gonna do is they're gonna try to exhibit the solution in terms of the numbers V1, V2, and V3. And to that end, what most people are probably gonna do is that they're probably just going to write down an augmented matrix that's associated to the matrix equation and just think about it. Um, the first three columns are generally associated with the variables for which you are trying to solve. So C1, C2, and C3 in that order. And if you stare at this long enough, you realize that C1 is equal to V1, C2 is equal to to V2 and C3 is equal to V3. Um, so that result is probably like the least surprising thing in the world. You, 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 can, you can get the result just by staring at the set of vectors and thinking about what you're trying to do. The coefficients C come from the vector. They're, they're the numbers that are sort of contained in V. So that's how you would handle that. But it's the second problem that's the actual issue. Um, the second question you're trying to find you're trying to show that that set spans R3. Now, I would point out that there's a slight difference between this set of vectors and this set of vectors. Not only are the vectors a little bit different, but there are four vectors in the second set and there are only three in the first set. So if you're trying to show that that second set of vectors spans R3, you'll proceed in the same way. So again, just focusing on this question right here, we need, we need to show that any vector v in R3 can be written as a linear combination 
of vectors in the set. So let's say I'll call this set S. It's a linear combination of the vectors in set S. Um, so how do we actually how do we actually do that? Um, you're trying to just again to slow things down a bit. You're trying to find c1, c2, c3, c4, for which this thing right here. So I need to go back and remember what the vectors are because I kind of made them up. Um, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. Um, the fourth vector, I guess, is zero one two. And when you when you take a look at that, you're trying to find the values. You're trying to find the solution of a certain equation for any vector v on the right. This amounts to doing something similar to what we did in the previous exercise, but the matrix equation is a little more complicated. So this is the same. So to find such C, this is, this is equivalent to being able to solve the following equation for any, for any V. So the vector v, you know, that's that's the numbers that you see on the right hand side. The vector v. Um, so you basically just take the call. You take the vectors that you see in this equation right here. You remember that matrix multiplication works a certain way. And so this is the goal. Um, you're, you're trying to get at uh, you're trying to get at solutions to system of equations to, to, a, to an equation that looks like this. Again, what most people are going to do in this circumstance is that they are going to write down an augmented matrix, which which sort of replicates for the purposes of calculation, which replicates this equation right 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 up here. And so that augmented matrix might look something like this. And so when you sit down and you begin to try to solve this equation using row reduction, um, you're trying to come up with a formula for the C sub i, the C1, the C2, the C3, and the C4 in terms of the values V that are in the vector. So this comes up with the linear combination. Um, one reason why this is a bit different than the last example, of course, last example is very easy. You're actually gonna have to do something here. Um, so if we, if we start by trying to row reduce the matrix, the matrix that you see right here is equivalent to the matrix one, zero, 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 V1. Um, you eliminate that position right there, that's zero. Um, you add negative one to the first row, add to the second row and replace the second row with that. Um, you got a bunch of zeros here, so not much happens, right? So you have a one, zero, and a one. Um, if you're adding the negative of the first row to the second row and then replacing the second row, what you're gonna wind up with is a minus V1 plus a V2 right here. And the third row is zero, one, one, two, three, three. Um, play the same game with the second pivot. Um, the second pivot is right here. You can use the second pivot. No, normally, we might eliminate the zero if we want. If we want to carry out Gauss-Jordan elimination fully, let's just say that we want to eliminate that one right here. Then we'll think about what we what we what we have. I mean, we will get something pretty nice if we do that. I think. Um, so again, if you use elementary row operations that we're used to, so you get a zero here, you get a zero here by design. Remember that what we're doing here is we're adding the negative of the second row to the third row and we're replacing the third row with whatever that is. It produces a zero below the second pivot. 
Um, negative one times zero is zero, so that doesn't really change that one. That's pretty convenient. Um, negative one times one here is a negative one, negative one and the two is a one. Finally, you kind of have to keep track of the solution column. And so in the last, last bottom right position, you get the negative of negative V1 plus V2 plus V3. Now, if you stare at this for a minute, um, you realize pretty quickly, not only is there one solution, but there are many solutions for the C's. Um, I mean, if you look at the first row, um, I mean, if, if you start with the last row, which is maybe what we usually do, remember that this is C1, C2, C3, and C4. What the last row suggests or, it, it, or indicates is that C3 plus C4 is equal to that whole thing right there. For the sake of the sake of simplicity, I'll probably just write that as V1 minus V2 plus V3. Um, second row is C2 plus C4 equal to negative V1 plus V2. And the first row is pretty straightforward is that C1 is V1. Um, so what I'm claiming is that, you know, the way that we would normally solve the system of equations is we would think about the last column C4 as representing a free variable and the first three columns, because those columns contain non-zero pivots, you know, we would think of them as the author of the book says as basic variables. So if we imagine that C4 varies freely, um, you know, we can write, you know, from here, we can write C3 as equal to V1 minus V2 plus V3 minus C4. From the second row, we can write C2 as C, C1. Um, we can write C2 as minus V1 plus V2 minus C4. Um, and C1 is just V1. And so if we're trying to write down like we normally would, a vector which in a, in a way parameterizes the solutions. We would write C1, C2, and C3, and C4 vertically. C1 would be V1. C2 would be minus V1 plus V2 minus C4. C3 would be V1 minus V2 plus V3 minus C4. And then the last guy would just be, um, the last guy would just be C4. C4 varies freely, sometimes you call it S. Um, when, you, when you sort of separate, so I guess I should write over here, C4 varies freely. Um, and so when you write all this down, um, you know, what do you, what do you wind up getting? Um, you know, you get a V1 minus V1 plus V2, V1 minus V2, plus V3, that'd be zero right here, plus C4, zero, minus one, minus one, one. And so when you're thinking about the space of solutions to the equation that we're talking about, it's pretty large. Um, we only need one solution Not, not all of them. So let C4 be zero and that picks out that vector right there. So we're letting C1 be V1, we're letting C2 be minus V1 plus V2. Finally, we're letting C3 be V1 minus V2 plus V3. We're letting C4 be zero. And those values of C define the linear combination. Um, and so there are no real restrictions which emerge as a result of solving a system of equations. You wind up being able to write down any vector in R3 as a linear combination of those four vectors. So that's how you might do it. Um, before I move on, does anyone have any questions about what we've looked at so far? When you're looking at trying to show that some set of vectors within a vector space spans the vector space, what you need to be able to show is that any vector within that vector space can be written as a linear combination of elements from the set that you're talking about, the, the set that you think spans the vector space. Equivalently, this amounts to solving an equation, a matrix equation of some kind, and you would typically approach that problem um, in the manner that we discussed, I think, last week and a little bit this week,
you simply look at the reduced row form, some reduced row form of, of a coefficient matrix or of an augmented matrix, um, and then you can kind of read off what the solutions are from there. Um, notice also in this example, um, I would point out also in this example, we can parameterize the C's. So it's, it's not only the case that you have one solution here, but you have an infinite number of solutions. And so there are a ton of ways, there are a ton of ways of writing down any vector in R3 as the linear combination of the vectors in the set S. There are lots of ways of doing it. Um, in order to show that we're dealing with a spanning set, you don't have to write down all ways of doing it. You only need one. Another thing I'd point out is we just took the easiest one when, when we put the free variable equal to zero, we just got the, we just got the direction, um, we got the uh, translation vector, that's, that's the first one. The particular solution sometimes it's called. Um, you know, you could pick out other ways of writing down an element in R3 as a linear combination of those vectors for different values of C4. If you change the value of the free variable, you get different linear combinations. One thing that's worth pointing out about that is that to produce a vector in C3, the linear combination is not unique in this case. Um, that's different. That's different than in the previous example where you had the so-called standard basis for R3. Those linear combinations are unique. The difference between these two examples is the addition of that fourth vector. So does anyone have questions about this so far? We're just talking about spanning sets. Yeah, um, I'm still a bit. So you have to be you have to be able to write it in a linear combination, and since um, the solution is going to be like it's going to equal to like um, a vector a vector v or like in the in that example, right? Yeah. It's gonna be like functions. We're gonna be dealing with functions and not actual. That's right. You're gonna be you're gonna be writing down, you're gonna be writing down the 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 coefficients c, but they will typically be in terms of the components of the vector v, if that makes sense. So if you go back to if you go back to what we're seeing here. We're saying that C1 equal to V1, C2 equal to minus V1 plus V2, C3 equal to V1 minus V2 plus V3, and C4 equal to zero, that those choices for C will exhibit any vector V as a linear combination of the vectors in the set S. Notice though, those are not the only choices you could make for C. And the reason is when you go about solving the equation that um, when you go about solving the matrix equation, what you learn as, as in, in, the, in the process of solving that equation is you learn that there are essentially an infinite number of ways of writing down a vector V and R3 as a linear combination of those, of those four vectors. So in this example, one, one thing that distinguishes the two examples that, we, that we've talked about so far is that in the first example, if you can write down a vector V as a linear combination of 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, then that linear combination is unique. There's no, uh, there's no two ways or more of writing down a vector V as a linear combination of 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, other than the one way that we produced. When you're talking about this particular problem right here that we just did, it turns out that there are many ways of writing down a vector v as a linear combination of those four vectors, and you can describe all the ways that um, and, and all the ways to write down a vector v as a linear combination of those four vectors can be accounted for by varying the value of the free variable. So to get one linear combination, all we did is we put the free variable equal to zero, and, and you know that's the choice we made. But suppose that you let the free variable be equal to minus one or two or something else. In cases like that, you get a linear combination and it's, it's totally reasonable to do this, um, you know, but you get one linear combination for each, for each value that the free variable can actually take on. Um, so there, the spanning set, which consists of four vectors, it is, it is true in this case that if you take a vector in R3, you will find out, you know, what we're saying here is that we, we, we do not have a unique way
of writing down a vector V as, as a unique linear combination of those vectors. There's more than one way of doing it. And that's one of the key features, that's one of the key things that, key characteristics which distinguishes the first and the second example. As it turns out, um, it also, that what we're talking about right now also distinguishes uh, a basis from something that is merely a spanning set. Um, a spanning set that we have here in the second example is a bit too large. Um, the lack of a unique representative or a unique choice um, is, is, what, is what makes it just a spanning set. It, it what, it's what prevents it from being a basis, basically. So is all this okay? Um, so I, I, yes, but, um, question about how C4 is a free variable. Um, C4? Yeah, because, okay, so C4 is talking about the column, column four, correct? That's right. Yeah, that's right. And it's a, it's a, is it a free variable because there isn't like a pivot? Yes. Yeah. And so when we wrote, that's exactly right. So C1, C2, and C3, they, they were using them to kind of denote columns in, in this augmented matrix. And each of those columns, in each of the first three columns, there is a non-zero pivot. The first pivot is one here. Second pivot is one here. The third pivot is one here. In the last column, no pivots. And so when we're, when we're row reducing a matrix and we're thinking about columns, um, when we're thinking about coming up with solutions of equations using these types of methods, you're gonna associate the columns that do not have pivots, to, that do not have uh, non-zero pivots. You'll associate those to free variables. And there's only one column like that in this case, it's C4. So C1, C2, and C3, we can write down the basic variables as functions of the various V values and also the variable C4. And when we do that, um, when we when we write down, you know, what the solutions look like to that to that equation, um, you know, you, you wind up having a lot of them because that free variable, you know, it can be whatever you want. Now, the easiest way of producing a linear combination, an example, the, the, so all solutions of that equation will result in a linear combination of those vectors, which will add up to v to the vector v. But the easiest linear combination, the one the one that's probably the most straightforward choice is just to let the free variable be zero. If you let the free variable, if you evaluate that at zero, then all you're really saying is that, well, okay, look, if we put C1 equal to something, put C2 equal to this other thing, if we put C3 still equal to this third thing, put C4 equal to zero, that will result in a linear combination, which, uh, which, will, which will give us what we want. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so would it be linear combination? Can you go back to it real quick? I wanted to see how it was written down, like once you there or. There. So it's written exactly like C1 equals V1, yep. C2. Okay. Yep. You, you don't have to write it as like kind of in vector notation. You could. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. Um, you could. I mean, you know, basically what you're, again, what you're trying to do is you could write down a, a, a column vector which, um, which uh, exhibits these various values of C as as a as a column vector, so it'd be fine to do that. Um, or you could just write down what the individual components of that vector are. So in either case, um, you know, either no matter how you write it, what you're what you're winding up with is a linear combination of the elements in the set S. You're exhibiting any vector v within R three as a linear combination of vectors within that set under the choices that we're making right here. Okay, thank you. Can I just see, um, I just wanted to look at. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it back uh, up. So the first there's, one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, the first example. Okay, I mean, I'll put, I'll put both back up. There's, there's one more question. Yes. Um, Professor, I just want to ask, um, 
and, and that mean if I can represent the um, the vector with one variable, then I will have like a single solution for. Yeah, um, it can happen. Because <laughs> um, it's a linear relationship, right? Yeah. If I can yeah. represent the vector. That's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's still a linear combination, right? Like if you if you can write one vector as a multiple of some other vector, that counts. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So um, you know, going back to going back to the idea of a spanning set, um, here was the solution. Um, the original problem was to so we did, did quite a bit, but. Um, the original problem was to find values. So we, we have a vector V, we wanted to be able to find values C1, C2, C3, and C4, um, which solved this equation. Another way of saying that is, is, is we're finding values C1, C2, C3, and C4, which exhibit the vector V as a linear combination of these four vectors. Um, if you think about matrix multiplication for a minute, the left-hand side can be thought of as a product of these two matrices. So another way of trying to address the question is simply trying to answer the following question. If you have a vector V, um, are there any conditions on the Vs which will, you know, make, which will cause a problem? Um, for any vector V, can you exhibit a solution C to this equation? Um, and so what most people are gonna do when they're confronted with a problem like that is they're gonna convert this thing into an augmented matrix. You do a bit of row reduction and you, know, you wind up getting this right here. Notice in this case, there are four columns, but only three pivots. This means that, that one of the columns is going to have to be a free variable. The typical way that we approach a problem like this is that it's the last column. You know, we're kind of arranging things if the free variable is at the end, that's how it worked out. Um, if C4 is a free variable and C1, C2, and C3 aren't, um, the idea, you know, when you write down everything is you're writing down, you're sort of back substituting, I guess, um, you're sort of writing down these equations and you're writing down C1, C2, and C3 in terms of the Vs and also the free variable. When you do something like that, you get a parameterization of the solution set to the equation that looks like this. We split it up this way um, and note that it is not only the case that there is one way of coming up um, with the formula for the Cs, but there are many ways, all of which depend on a choice for the free variable. So if you take any choice of free, free variable, you, you have what you want. The easiest choice is when the free variable is equal to zero, but it's not the unique choice. Um, and that actually is kind of an important fact. It's worth remembering. In this example, the basis, or rather the, uh, the spanning set that we're dealing with has four vectors. In the first example, the spanning set, it also spans R3 only has three vectors. It turns out, and, and maybe, and if you thought about the idea of, geom if, you, if you think about the idea of dimension as having something to do with the geometry and, you know, it's not surprising that in the, in, you know, if you have three vectors rather than four, you're, you're sort of reducing the number of free thing, free choices you can make. Um, we wanna talk about stuff that looks more like the first example. Stuff that looks like the last example sometimes causes a problem. Um, we wanna be able to take something in the fourth, like in the fourth example, and we wanna be able to reduce, um, we sometimes wanna be able to take spanning sets and reduce them, reduce their size um, to maybe a more minimal set. Um, so we talked about one example in which that was possible, I think, yesterday, but we didn't really provide any clues as to how one might do this. But that's kind of where we are right now. Um, so we have the idea of a spanning set. If you want to show that a set of vectors spans a given vector space, all it really involves is exhibiting the vector within a particular space that you're talking about as a linear combination of elements within the set that is supposed to span the vector space. Um, and in a way, you've kind of already done a problem like this. If you go back to written assignment two and think about it for a minute, in written assignment two, problem two on written assignment two is essentially asking about the following. It's essentially asking you to show that the three vectors in the coefficient matrix coming from the set of equations that you're dealing with span R3. Um, in other examples, you know, if there's some restriction on, on what can be achieved, then I think that you might say that the column vectors do not span, you know, the full set of vectors in R3 or R4 or whatever it is you're talking about. Um, so does anyone ha have questions about this so far? Is it all right? So I want to talk about, um, you know, a few more things. 
So let's see, I'm gonna shift. I wanna talk more about, um, I actually wanna give a definition for, for a basis, I think, before I move on. Um, you know, so when people talk about a basis, spanning sets are, there, there's a little bit more freedom in a sense. So in the second example that we just did, we're dealing with a spanning set. In the first example we did, we're actually dealing with a basis. So let's see what distinguishes a spanning set from something that is merely a spanning set from something that's a basis. A basis is defined as being a minimal spanning set. So what that means is that a basis is a set of vectors within the vector space, which spans the vector space and is linearly independent. And so the, linearly, the linear independence condition is the, is the condition that's preventing what we're seeing in the second example. In the second example that we're working on, it is not only the case that there is one linear combination which exhibits a vector in R3 as a linear combination of those vectors. It's that there are an infinite number of such linear combinations. And when you, when you say that a vector, when you say that a spanning set is linearly independent, what you're trying to kind of keep tamp down is that freedom. So you're reducing the size of the spanning set in some sense. So when you have a spanning set, if that spanning set is too big, it's not going to give a correct account of dimension, which is in accord with people's geometric intuition about what dimension ought to mean in the context of things like Rn. So when you're talking about the number of elements in the second example, there are four of them in that spanning set. What most people will think or say is R3 is three-dimensional. And so what if you think about a basis or the notion of, or the algebraic notion of dimension, we're trying to give an accounting of, of, of a, you know, it's pure algebra, but we want to give an account which is at least compatible with what people think ought to be true about the dimension of something like R3. A set of four elements is too big. It can actually be reduced. It can in fact be reduced in that case by throwing out the last vector, then you would be left with the basis. In that example. Um, so, you know, back to the definition. A basis is a set of vectors within a vector space, which spans the vector space and is also linearly independent. Um, so, we talked about this example, the previous example with this three by four matrix. In this example, the columns of A, that column, that column, and that column, and that column, span the column space of A by definition. But it turns out that only the first and the third column of this matrix span the column space. So two out of the four columns are necessary to span the column space. You don't need the other two. So the dimension of the column space is only two when you think about the column space of that matrix. Now we're gonna wind up talking about that a little bit more in detail. Not that interested in doing the calculations, which totally justify that, um, but that's the idea. So before we move on and do any more examples, do people have an, an idea of what a basis is? Remember, all we're trying to do with the basis is give an algebraic characterization for what people kind of already believe to be true. So things like Rn ought to have dimension n, um, because geometrically, it just seems like that should be the case. The intuition is such that you know R3, R4, these things ought to be three and four dimensional spaces. You have three or four coordinate axes which define the location of points. When you're talking about the algebraic characterization of dimension, the words are, that we're using are the same, but you wanna come up with an algebraic characterization which is compatible with people's intuition about these spaces. So when you talk about R3, you wanna think that a basis for R3 should have three elements. And so, and, and of course we can exhibit a basis which does. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to talk about the problem that people brought up yesterday. Um, um, I have think, a, yeah. Um, so with basis, that's the least required, like um, the least vectors. The least vectors required. Yeah. To span a certain. That's span. right. It's a minimal spanning set. Yeah. So like, I kind of. So are you saying that okay? For instance, if you have like, I'm not sure if it correlates or not, but like if you have like a vector in R3, like, does that, that doesn't necessarily mean you need like, um, what's it called? Like V1, V2 and V3 in order to span R3 or does that? Does it, it does mean that, yeah. <laughs> so, but, you, yeah, so one thing that you, one thing that it's possible to show is that in your example with R3, one vector alone does not span R3. 
If you have one vector within R3, you can always find a vector that is not in the span of the one vector. And the reason for this is if you only have one vector and you think about all linear combinations of a single vector, all you're really talking about are scalar multiples of that vector. So suppose that you think about a vector in R3 that looks like one, two, one. The only thing, the only vectors in the span of one, two, one are vectors where the vector, which each component of the vector is a multiple of one, of two, and of one. If you pick a vector for which that statement is not true, it's not in the span of that one vector. So one vector is not enough. And in fact, two vectors are not enough. To get R3, you need three vectors to span R3, at least three. Um, it turns out that if you have more than three, like in the example that we saw, then in a sense, that's too many. Um, but it's also true that any old vector, any old three vectors may not span R3. You know, you can construct a set of three vectors which don't span R3 if you just take a vector and you take two multiples of that vector, right? You've, you've added nothing to the, to the set if you've done that. Um, but what, we're try what I'm trying to say is, I guess, if you're thinking about things like R3, the geometric intuition is that something like R3 ought to have dimension three. Um, and most people are gonna believe something like this because there are three coordinate axes which are kind of providing a set of directions to any point that's contained within R3. When you talk about the notion of a spanning set or a basis, you're trying to come up with an equivalent algebraic characterization of dimension, which is compatible with that geometric intuition. So things like R3 shouldn't have dimension four, right? It should have dimension three, and you're trying to define dimension in a way that, that you feel like is, 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 is useful, but it's also you know, compatible with what you kind of already believe to be true about R3. And so when you're, when you're talking about the idea of a basis, it's sort of this long conversation where you're sort of getting around to defining the notion of dimension, the dimension of a vector space. And so when we think about R3, however we define the idea of basis and dimension, we want our algebraic characterization of dimension to be such that the dimension of R3 is three. Um, but as we'll see, there are, there are problems, there are problems with, with, what we might, with what we might try to do. Not really problems, but there are things that have to be addressed. Is that okay? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, like an example of, let's say, um, a vector that doesn't span R3, but that does have like V1, V2, V3. Like, if like V3 or like one of them is like uh, a free variable, will that mean that it won't span R3? No, it's 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 uh it's a bit like this. Let me write down. Um, I'll write down a couple of things. You know, maybe to make to give to give you some non examples are sometimes are sometimes helpful as well. So consider R three. Um, R three the set of all vectors v, which can be expressed as a column. Yes, with three entries. And if our set S is only one to one, if it's only one vector, then the span of S is not equal to R3. And the reason you can always find a vector outside span s. So what does span s look like in this case? So if s consists of a single vector, um, span s is equal to the collection of r times that vector, where r is free. So a vector like uh, 1, 0, 1 is not in span s. And the reason why is that vector 1, 0, 0 cannot be written as a scalar multiple of 1, 2, 1, if that makes sense. So when you're talking about a single vector within R3, you are going to be able to find vectors which are not in the span. Does that make sense? So, but usually, wouldn't you like 
do an augmented matrix and you have you could um you 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 could i mean you know you can but you can sh you, you could right but how many uh, but i guess the question is how many uh, you know the augmented matrix would would only have two columns and you can you can kind of see that that you can kind of see that it's not going to work out right like if you take one two one or if you take if you take any scalar of one two one what would it mean Oops, what would it mean? What would it mean to say, so can you find R which satisfies R one to one, I guess I'll put the R over here, equal to one zero zero. Right. Um, I mean, what, if you put things down in an augmented matrix, it would look like a two column matrix, right? Solution columns over here, um, your, your vector is here, um, but you can see pretty quickly that this row reduces to something that's, that's, that's really weird, right? Um, you, know, you wind up getting zeros here, but, but non-zero things here. So you get an inconsistent system, right? So you have one, one, that doesn't change. You get two zeros here, you get a minus two here, and I guess a minus one here. So in your solution column, you get zero rows, but sort of a short row associated to associated to non-zero solutions. And so what that's saying, you know, in, in the matrix language, what that's saying is that there's no solution to that equation. There is no R that satisfies that satisfies the equation that you want. There's no multiple of one two one, which will give you one zero zero. But so that. So that element one zero zero is not in the span of S for this reason. Um, one thing that you can do to try to correct that defect, you can create a new S. So an interesting thing to do would be, would be to do this. We'll, we'll extend, suppose we let S be one to one and we add the vector one zero zero to it. Um, you can ask yourself, is the span of S equal to R3? In this case, um, and so, you know, you're asking yourself basically, can any vector be written as a linear combination of those two vectors? And if you reduce that to some sort of matrix form, you're going to find out you're, again, there's going to be a vector that you're going to be able to find that escapes you. So those two vectors are not enough to span R3 either. But what I would say is that once you find a vector that's not in the span of that S that I just wrote down, if you were to put that new vector into the set, then you'd be in business. Does that make sense? Um, uh, kind of, uh, but like, so that back, so we're looking for, uh, so we're looking if that, if those vectors span like the set as, so is it always going to, so is that like what we're always looking for if these vectors span this specific set over R3 or is it like these vectors are spanning in R3? Like, so if you're, you're just trying to, I guess we're just trying to address the question, um, you know, how should we make sense of the idea of dimension in this particular, in this particular example? Um, and so, you know, if you're talking about R3, if, if, you're, if you're limiting, if you're, if you're only talking about R3 and you're asking yourself the question, how many vectors do I need so that I'm pretty sure that that, vec that set of vectors spans R3? All we've really shown so far is that one vector, probably not enough. Um, you can go further than that and show, and, and, and why is that? Well, the, the reason is that if you take one vector you're always going to be able to find a vector that is not a multiple of that vector. Um, and that's essentially what we did. We just found a vector that's not a multiple of one to one, just chose any vector that's not a multiple of one to one. If we were to take one zero zero and then put it into a set, which also contained one to one, now you've got a set of two vectors and you can then ask, well, is that enough? Um, well, if, if my set S consists of the vectors one to one and one zero zero, I would say that in fact, it is not enough. And the reason is that if you were to try to solve, uh, again, if you, if you, if you do what, um, if you approach the problem the way that, you know, by, by putting things into an augmented matrix, 
um, you know, you, you will find that there's some restrictions on the number of vectors you can actually get out of those two vectors. There's, there's a constraint coming from, um, you know, that, that will appear when you, when you reduce the row, the augmented matrix. And so, you know, you can find a vec, you can certainly find a vector, you can find a vector that, that's not in the span of those two vectors, but let's just see. I mean, let's just see what happens. So it will turn out not to be the case, but let's see what we let's see what we can get. Um, so you know, span is span s equal to r. If you if you kind of cut to the chase, what you're looking for. Is is this sort of thing, right? What kind of v are you going to produce if you look at all possible linear combinations of those two vectors? Um, so, and and remember, you know, we're we're usually associating c1 and c2 to the columns. So, if you begin to row reduce this matrix and you begin to think about what kind of v you would get, um, you know, we can we can flip, we can. Uh, well, we might as well do the most straightforward thing possible. So we take one, one, be one. Um, we produce zeros here. Um, we get a negative two here. Yes. Um, we get negative two. We need a little bit more room. Um, we take negative two and add it here. Negative two here. Um, negative two v one plus v two here. Um, zero is here, probably negative one here. In the last position, we get negative V1 plus V3. Um, we move down to the second pivot. Um, lots of things you can do with that, but um, you know, one thing you can do, let's see, that's still V1, negative two, negative two V1 plus V2. Um, if we wanna produce a zero below the second pivot, this amounts to multiplying that entire row by negative one half and then adding it to the uh, to the uh, to, to the last row. So um, negative 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 one half times negative two is one. One and one is zero. When you multiply negative one half by this entire thing right here, um, negative one half times negative two v one is a v one that adds with a v one here. It cancels it to zero, and so you wind up getting a negative one half v two plus V3 in the last column. Um, I would point out at this time that the only way, because that's a zero row, the only way um, for the system to be consistent, to have, to have solutions is for negative one half of V2 plus V3 to be zero. And so in order to find a vector that is not in the span of those two of those two vectors, all you've got to do is produce a vector for which that last condition is not satisfied. So um, an example of a vector for which that's true, as it turns out, um, just take zero negative one half one and For example, if you took zero, negative one half one, that, that ought to do the trick. Um, but really, as long as you found a vector that was not subject to that last constraint, then, um, then those two vectors wouldn't span it if you were able to find. But there's always gonna be, um, if, if you have a constraint that looks like this, as long as you, know, you, pick, you pick a vector for which that last equation is not satisfied, you have a vector that's not in the span of the two vectors. If you were to take that last vector that we're talking about, the one I just wrote down, if you were to add it into the set S, then you would be then you would have a situation where you would you would have something that would span R3. If that makes sense. So in this in this example, this extended example that we're doing, we start with a single vector, we find a vector that's not in the span of the single vector, and we add it to the set S. We look at the span of those two vectors. The third thing we do is we find a vector that's not in the span of those two vectors and we add it to the set. At that point, you know, you're going to wind up in a situation where you have three vectors which do span R3, as it turns out. Okay, thank you. And so the three vectors would work in this case. Let's see. 
and you know there are other um, there are other other things you can do with um, hang on just one second I think that's the wrong document no it's right um, and you know, so but remember that the whole point, you know, when we're talking about basis and dimension, it's just it's just useful to remember the whole point in the back of your mind. Remember that all that we're really doing here is we're trying to say something reasonable about what dimension of a vector space ought to be, that is at least in accord with what um, with what people's geometric intuition mostly is. That's all we're really doing. Um, so to go back to a set of slides. I think the one that I wanted to talk about, again, going back to this, a basis for a vector space is a set of vectors which spans the vector space and is also linearly independent. Um, the second condition ensures that um, you're dealing with a minimal spanning set, a spanning set that has the fewest set of vectors. Um, one non-example of a basis, um, if you look at the column space of this particular matrix that you see right here, by definition, the columns of that matrix span the column space of the matrix. But it turns out that that set of vectors, the column vectors coming from the matrix, there are four of them, as you can see, it turns out that you only need two of them to span the column space. So it turns out that the first and the third column vectors span the entire column space. Um, that has something to do with the echelon form of that matrix, um, where the first and the third columns of A, when it's an echelon form, are, are places where you have the non-zero pivots, but we're going to wind up talking exactly why something like that's true next week. Um, other non-examples of bases, um, we've seen an example just by playing around with the idea of a spanning set. If you're dealing with R3, if you have one vector, you're certainly not going to get a get a spanning set for R3. You don't have enough vectors. You need you need a couple more. Um, there's actually a way of systematically building up a spanning set out of a single vector by adding one vector at a time which is somehow outside of the, spa the spanning set. You can detect this by looking at some kind of matrix, um, by some kind of augmented matrix when you try to solve some kind of system of equations. Um, you gradually build up the spanning set from a spanning set consisting of a single vector. And you can start with a single vector and you can extend that vector to a basis. That idea is not unimportant. So, um, so if you have a single vector, you can always sort of add stuff in to get a basis or if, if you have a, or if you have a set of vectors which doesn't span a vector space, you're usually going to have to add a vector in, but you have to do so carefully. You generally want to be able to find a vector which is not in the span of the vectors that you start with. So we just saw sort of a small example of this. On the other hand, spanning sets can be too large. Um, if you go back and look at the example that you did earlier where you had the four vectors in R3, um, the second example we did early on when we, we exhibited any vector in R3 as a linear combination of those four vectors, in that particular case, when we try to solve a system of equations, we wind up getting an augmented matrix. Um, in the coefficient part of the matrix, in the left part of the matrix, we have three basic variables and one free variable. In a case like that, you're gonna to wanna to throw that last vector out. Um, really all you're saying with that decomposition, um, with, that, with, with, with producing V as a linear combination of those four vectors, by choosing the free variable C4 to be zero, we're sort of saying we don't really need it. Um, we don't really need that last column. We don't really need that last vector. So that's one way of trying to identify how to get rid of how to get rid of vectors within a spanning set to reduce it to a basis. So um, a couple of again, a couple of problems could occur if you're talking about bases. You get too few vectors. You could have too many. Um, with the basis, you just have the right number. It's just right. Um, and so with the examples that we're thinking about, with the notion of dimension that we want to get to. Um, you know, we, we want to be able to say something coherent about it. Um, the problem, um, the problem that we should run into at this point is that the choice of basis is not unique. Um, like what, with what we're seeing, um, there's an obvious basis for R3 that most people would choose if they were left to their own devices. And that's the one that consists of the vectors 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. That's not the only basis for R3 that exists, um, as we've also seen. So we'll talk about that next. It's one of the major, one of the major issues. Um, one of the major ideas in the section involving, involving discussion of basis is that the choice of a basis is not unique. 
So if you have a vector space, any vector space has a basis, but the elements of the vector space are not uniquely determined by the fact that you're dealing with the basis. What is unique is the number of elements in any basis for the vector space. So what that means is that for something like R3 or R4 or anything within them, if you have a basis for R3, then any other basis for R3 is going to have exactly the same elements as the basis that you have. The vectors within the basis may not be the same, but the basis, but the number of, or the size of the basis, the cardinality of the basis will be the same. So that's the invariant of the vector space that most people want to discuss. It's the dimension. So the number of elements in any basis for a vector space that's known as the dimension of the vector space. It's just the same. Is this okay? Good, bad, good. So what I'd like people to try to do um, to spend a little time um, just to sort of verify some things, I'll just do a couple of problems. Um, you know, write down a couple of, you know, show a couple of things, describe, uh, you know, dealing with basis and spanning sets. So we've already dealt with one problem and I don't, I don't want to mess, I don't want to mess with it, but here's another, here's another question for people to work on for a few minutes. Show that the set S One one zero zero one one zero one zero is a basis for R three. Note that this will involve two things to do. Show that span of S, the collection of all linear combination of those vectors, is equal to R3. Um, what you mean by equal here, any V in R3 is linear combination of vectors in S and show that the elements of S are linearly independent. So um, we'll talk a few minutes about this. Um, maybe do a couple of these exercises, work through these two, show that you're dealing with a spanning set, show that that set is linearly independent. Those two things together will guarantee that the set that you're dealing with is a basis for R3. So right now it's about 1016. Take about five minutes to do so, to, to do these two problems. They both involve solving systems with equations. So you're gonna wind up writing down some augmented matrices and looking at what you get. In the first case, you just want to exhibit any vector in R3 as a linear combination of those three vectors somehow. In the second case, you want to show that there is no non-trivial linear combination which adds up to the zero vector in R3. Hey, sorry about this. Yeah. Can you go back to the screen real quick? So I go back? I thought I finished the screen. Yeah, I'll, I'll, put it, I'll put it back up. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So um, I'll put that back up on the screen. It's about 1017. Um, take five minutes or so to work through the, the, the two things that you have to do. Um, then we'll come back and talk about it a little bit. So let's look at the problem a little bit, um, talk about um, why what we're dealing with is indeed a basis for R3, remembering what, what it is that we have to check in this kind of example. So we've got that set right there. Um, there are two things to check. We want to check that the span of S is all of R3, um, and we want to check that the elements which are contained in S are linearly independent. And to do those two things involves thinking about equations, but thinking about one and then the other side, so to speak, of the system. So to show to show that span S um, is all of R3, we need 
we need to explain how any vector v in R3 can be exhibited as a linear combination of vectors in, vectors in S. Um, so, you know, let V be the usual thing. It's just, it's just uh, you know, a column vector. Um, we need to see C1, C2, and C3 would satisfy see, the equation um, C1, 1, 1, 0 plus C2, 0, 1, 1 plus C3, 0, 1, 0 equal to our vector B. Um, so the, the left-hand side of that equation is um, equivalent to some kind of matrix multiplication where the vectors are arranged into columns in the first factor. So we're dealing with an equation that looks like this. So we have C1, C2, C3 right here. And on the right, we have V1, V2, and V3. Um, so far, except for naming things, and except for some of the changes in numbers, the, the problem we're trying to address here is basically the same as problem two on the first written assignment. Um, so what most people are going to do when they try to address this question is, is they're going to come up with the augmented matrix associated with the system and then just see where they, where they get. Now, we've kind of already done this work, um, you know, in a way, um, but in any case, probably not, not too bad to do it again. So you have one, zero, zero, V1. Um, you have a zero here and a zero here. You have a one here and a one here. To get the zero below the first pivot, um, you need to add negative one to the first column as the second. So you get negative V1 plus V2. Um, you have a one here and a zero here because we haven't really done anything to the last to the last row. Um, so that's that's the first thing you do when you continue to row reduce. We move to the second pivot again. Nothing really above it. The zero is below it. Um, you have one zero zero v one. Um, in the second row, you've got zero one one minus v one plus v two. Last row, you've got zero, zero. To produce the zero there, what we needed to do is to take the second row, multiply it by negative one, and add it to the third row and replace the third row with that. So I think you get a negative one right here. Um, and in the last, a little bit more room, um, in the last position right here, you take the negative of that and add it to the V3. So you get minus, minus V1 plus V2 plus V3. It kind of looks bad, so let me... Do that. Um, so we finish up. Oops. We finish up. Um, you know, when we row reduce the matrix, it's easiest to read out things off when we're dealing with the identity. We may as well row reduce the whole thing. So we get one, zero, zero, V1. Um, yeah. Like, could you have also swap the rows? I wasn't necessarily sure because yeah, yeah, you you can do you 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 can do any anything like that. Um, you know, swapping the rows should be fine. Like, you could do that. I think at the, you know, you could you could swap the second row with the third row, right? At some point, yeah. <laughs> and you know that's that's also that's also fine. Um, but when you do that, you have you have to remember to swap the whole the whole row, right? Including like V three and um, that's right, yeah, that's right. V two minus that's right. Um, and so, you know, we get something like this. We multiply through. Um, we take the negative, which you see down there. That's V one minus V two 
plus v2, I think. Should be negative, right? Minus v3. Um, and you know, to finish up, we put a zero there. But I'm, I won't do that last step. But um, roughly speaking, you kind of see what's going to happen um, when we eliminate above the third pivot, when we eliminate the one, the right-hand column will, will give us solutions for the C1, the C2, and C3. So we're going to know what those things are in terms of the Vs. So before I move on, and that basically establishes that we're dealing with the basis for our three, um, we can find formulas for the Cs. They happen to be in terms of the numbers V1, V2, and V3, but there's no problem with that. Um, we can exhibit any vector in our three as a linear combination of those three vectors. So the three vectors that we're dealing with are a spanning set. Um, are there questions about this so far? We'll have a formula for the Cs. You know, there's one more thing you have to do, I guess, to get it. It's probably no big deal to get there. Um, when we're thinking about the last thing, when we're trying to talk about that, the fact that it's a basis, it's not only that we have a spanning set, but it's also the case that it, but it, that it is a minimal spanning set. We want to be able to show that those three vectors are linearly independent. Now, what I would say in a case like this is in some sense, we already have done that um, indirectly. Um, if the Vs were all zero, um, we can show that there is only a unique solution to the equation a, C equal to zero with the matrix A is the columns of, of, of the, it comes from the, the set S, the columns are, it's the same matrix we just dealt with, I guess. Um, so I'll write that part down. So there's a bit more to do here, but I'll leave that part out. Um, we need to show the set is linearly independent as well. Um, and you know, if you think about what, what it is we're doing so far, you know, without, without writing every detail down, this amounts to showing that the set or showing that the equation One one zero zero one one zero one zero C one C two C three equal to the zero vector has only the trivial solution that is C one equal to C two equal to C three equal to zero. Um, if you if you think about this, there's probably not much of a need to actually do the row reduction because you've kind of already done it when you're talking about the spanning set. Um, when you're thinking about the matrix, which consists of the columns of the which consist of columns coming from the vectors in the spanning set, it's pretty clear that that matrix reduces to the identity matrix, and this allows you to read off a set of solutions. If the, if the, if you're trying to solve an equation like the one we just saw, pretty easily because that last column consists of just zeros. So when you row reduce the matrix and you use Gauss-Jordan to do it, the matrix that you're dealing with reduces to the identity matrix, essentially as we just saw. Because of that fact, the only thing that solves that equation is C1 equal to C2 equal to C3 equal to zero. So you only have a trivial solution in this case. There are no free variables. Does that make sense? We have the number of pivots equal to the number of columns in the matrix. There are three pivots, three columns, no room for a free variable. So in a case like this, you have only a unique solution. You have one solution when the number of pivots is equal to the number of columns. And that's exactly what we have here. There's not much more to say about that. Um, so what we've just shown is, what we've just done is we've taken a set of vectors S. We've shown that the span of that set of vectors is all of our three because we can exhibit any vector V as a linear combination of the elements within S. We've also shown that the elements of S are um, are uh, linearly independent just by looking at, again, an equation. When we take the equation and we use sort of conventional methods to try to solve it, what we wind up with is when we reduce, when we reduce the matrix, uh, when we row reduce the matrix in the normal way, we wind up with the matrix with three pivots. Since there are three columns, there's no room for a free variable, therefore a unique solution. So in a case, to, to, in, in homogeneous case. So what you're seeing here um, is a basis. Now notice it's not really the basis that anyone would naturally choose. If you take a base, but it is a basis. It's got three elements, just like the standard ordered basis 
It's another example of a basis. It has three elements, just like the standard ordered basis, but you know, it's not the same basis. Is this okay so far? So you can ask yourself, how many bases for a vector space like R3 are there really? Um, we, we have at least two, I guess, but it turns out that there are an infinite number of possible choices of bases. The only thing they all have in common, the only thing that they all have in common is that they have the same number of elements if we're talking about the same vector space. So in the case of R3, a basis for R3 will always have three vectors within it. A basis for R4 will always have four vectors within it. A basis for Rn will always have n vectors within it. Um, when you're talking about things like row spaces, column spaces, and null spaces, the situation is somewhat less clear um, because those are not naturally equal to things like R2 and R3, but rather that they are embedded within those larger vector spaces as subspaces. Um, so that's probably the next thing to talk about. Um, you know, at some point, I want to be able to give a justification for maybe at the end of today of why you should think that any two bases for the same vector space have the same number of elements. Um, there's one thing to do before we get to that discussion, but before we do it, I'd like to have you work on a problem. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about that problem a little bit, sort of indicate what we need to do in order to convince ourselves that we're really right about it. Um, here's another matrix. So let a be equal to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So here's a, here's a problem. Find a basis for the null space of A. So remember the null space of A is the set of vectors V which satisfy the equation AV equal to the zero vector. Um, believe it or not, um, you've done a million problems like this. Try another version. So try it again and we'll talk about it a little bit. There's a technical issue um, that I am prompted to talk about at this time um, when we're thinking about something like, like this problem. Um, but you know, first you try it. Remember, you're going to have to check two things. You're going to have to show that you know whatever you think, whatever set of vectors you think spans the null space, and you know however you write you know the linear combin, however you write vectors v which satisfy certain equations as linear combinations of these alleged basis vectors. Um, you're going to have to show that that set of vectors spans the null space of A, and you're going to have to also show that the set of vectors that you're dealing with is linearly independent. So try those two things, try them. See how far you get. Um, it's about 11.37. Um, take about five to eight minutes to do it. Maybe at 11.45, we'll discuss a little more. Okay, so back to the question um, when we're thinking about the null space of A. So let's go back to it. Um, I'll describe what, what I think most people are going to do when they address this problem. Um, I won't do each of the calculations, but um, you know, you probably don't need me to do that anyway. So when you're talking about the null space of A, you know, what most people, you know, when you're trying to find a basis for the null space of A, and you're, you're thinking about how, how to do that, what most people are going to do is they're going to first consider the equation AV equal to the zero vector. Um, in this case, you're looking at one, two, three, four, zero, five, six, seven, eight, zero, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, zero. So, in thinking about this particular problem, most people would, will reduce the calculation of the null space of A into, um, you know, they'll probably make a, an augmented matrix and then think about. Um, um, and then think about what what types of what types what 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 does the solution space of that look like? Now, what most people will do next is row reduce the matrix. And so, what I think is true, if I've done that arithmetic right, is after some number of steps, you can reduce. Um, you can find the. In fact, in this case, the reduced row echelon form of A, and it looks a bit like this. 
So it's negative, rather negative one. Ah. Negative one, negative two, zero, um, zero, one, two, three, zero. And then finally a row of zeros. So when you reduce the augmented matrix, I think you get something like this. Um, from this, what people what people are going to do um, if you let if you let the vector v be you know elements v with the usual notation, you let v1, v2, v3, and v4. Um, I guess we're saying that there will wind up being a couple of free variables which somehow get used to describe the null space. Um, and if that's true, then probably your intuition about this problem is that. Uh, is that is that the null space is two dimensional, right? So the basis for the null space consists of two elements, and and let's write down what those are. Um, again, what most people are going to do is they get to this point, they've got the zero row. Um, when you convert this back into the language of equations, and the last two columns represent free variables, um, and you get v one equal to v three plus two v four. Um, you get v2 equal to minus 2 v3 minus 3 v4 and you know v3 and v4 are free. So when you parameterize the solution space, which is what most people are going to do, they're, they're asked to do a problem like this, they're going to wind up getting v3 plus 2 v4 here for v1. They're going to get minus 2 v3 minus 3 v4 for v2. Um, you're going to get a V3 and a V4 here. So hopefully most people kind of got to something that vaguely looks like that. Um, so to continue it, you know, we would normally break that thing up. We kind of see what we're dealing with. Um, when I write down, um, when I write this down in terms of the two free variables, I'm looking at the two vectors, I should get a one, a negative two, one, zero, plus, you know, another free variable of scalar times the other vector, maybe a two, minus three, zero, one. Now, the vector here and the vector here, we wanna say, we want to say that the vector, the, the, the set of two vectors, negative, the one, negative two, one, zero, and the other one, two, negative three, zero, one, span the null space A, so in A. We want to say that. Um, I mean, there's a quick, um, you know, there's, there's sort of a quick verification. You, you can show pretty much immediately that that set of two vectors is linearly independent. Um, that's pretty evident because they're not scalar multiples of each other, but, you know, for the sake of completeness, it's probably worth doing. Um, I don't know that I want to talk in detail about how to solve the equation. I'd rather talk about something else. Can we really say that? I mean, how can we be sure? What we've really found are vectors which span the null space of U where U is the reduced row echelon form of A. And you can check this, you can check this pretty much immediately because all the steps, um, it's, it's pretty evident, you know, that we're building these vectors in it. We're building the, the characterization of, of of, of this null space in that way. So basically, if you take one, negative two, one, zero, if you were to take that vector and, oops, and plug it in, uh, and, and plug it into, you know, the system of equations coming from, from, from U, you know, you're, when I'm talking about U, I'm just talking about the first four columns of the augmented matrix. Um, if you were to take the, the choices that we're making for our vectors, either that vector and that vector by, by construction, you can see pretty quickly that those two vectors, those two vectors, 
are solutions to the system of equations that you define. And that's evident. Um, you can go back and you can plug it in. In fact, you were building the ve those vectors in that way. You know, there's no, there's no choice about whether or not those two vectors that we're talking about are contained in the null space of U. And in fact, the span of those vectors is the null space of U because again, by construction, anything in the null space of U, um, anything in the null space of U can be written as a linear combination of those vectors. And, and so when we're thinking about just the reduced row echelon form of A, it's not hard to see that those two vectors not only span N of A, they are a bit, or not only span N of U, they're a basis for N of U. Any vector in the null space of U can be written as a linear combination of those vectors. And in fact, any linear combination of those vectors is contained in the null space of U. So they, they span it. Um, they're also, the two vectors are also evidently linearly independent. So you do have a basis for N of U. Um, this is a technical point, but it's not an unimportant one. And it's related to a question that people probably have about linear algebra from the first week. When you have a system of equations and you undertake elementary row operations in order to solve that system, you are modifying that system. You're transforming it basically one step at a time, either into a diagonal system or, you know, at worst, some kind of triangular system that you can solve either through forward or back substitution, just thinking about what the solutions ought to look like when the, when the, when the, when the system of equations looks a certain way. One thing that we discussed in week one one thing that we discussed in week one was that the sort of elementary row operations that we were discussing don't change the solution space of a particular set of equations. Um, I left that, that issue of justifying that aside, but I think now probably is the moment to discuss this. Um, we have in our, in our hands, you know, we have in our hands a set of, a set of two vectors which span in of u. The question that, that I think we try to, that we need to answer is why is the null space of A the same as the null space of U when U is the reduced row echelon form of A? And when, when you're thinking about the relationship between A and U, in order to understand the answer to this question, the answer to this question is, is sort of the mantra that, well, okay, look, if you, if you use these elementary row operations on the system of equations, then it doesn't change the solution space. But that's ultimately pretty unsatisfying um, because we never really justified that. What I'd like to do is to take a moment and to describe why something like that is true just by looking at equations. And I'm hoping that people will see the utility of using, um, the, the utility of using, um, elementary matrices to describe what it is that we're doing. So suppose that the vector V is in the null space of A. Then V satisfies, satisfies the equation AV equal to the zero vector. So that by definition, right? Also, each elementary row operation corresponds So each elementary row operation, I guess, on A corresponds to left multiplication of A by an invertible elementary matrix that is and this is a bit like one of the problems you did on the first written assignment um, you can write the reduced row echelon form of a which I think we're just calling u in this case as equal to pi times A, where pi is a product of elementary matrices. Finally, anything multiplied 
by a zero vector. Here's the zero vector. Um, you have to check dimension issues, but that's not going to be an issue here because the elementary matrices are square. So when we're thinking about when we're thinking about um, talking about the null space of A being the same as the null space of U, we need to be able to show that any element V which is in the null space of A is also in the null space of U. But to show that something is in the null space of U, we have to show that UV is equal to zero. And what I'm proposing to do is to create to create U by multiplying A on the left by a product of elementary matrices, just like on written assignment one, I think it's question four or five, maybe five, maybe four, well, maybe three actually, um, where you write down a product pi of elementary matrices, which row reduces a matrix. So in this example, you know, to return to it briefly, because V satisfies AV equal to zero, pi times AV, V also satisfies, well, I guess I should write this as well, V satisfies pi AV equal to pi zero. Pi times zero is zero. Pi times A is U. So that equation right here is really the same as UV equal to zero. So all that we've really shown so far is that any element that is in the null space of A is also in the null space of U. Um, so does that make sense so far? We just canceled in some sense. We took A, we rendered it into an echelon form by multiplying on the left by pi. And when we did that, if V satisfies a certain equation that, that A defines, it must also satisfy an equation that U defines. So it's certainly true that any element in the null space of A is within the null space of U. And in effect, the matrix pi is, the matrix, the matrix pi, the product of the elementary matrices, it's keeping track of the row operations necessary to convert A into U. Um, to see the other way, so now let V be an element of the null space of U. Then V satisfies. The equation uv equal to the zero vector. Now, when you're thinking about this for a minute, how do you get a back from u, <laughs> right? Um, we have to invert if u is equal to pi times a, then v satisfies pi a v equal to zero, or equivalently, pi a v equal to zero. Pi is invertible, and that's because it's a product of elementary matrices, which are all themselves invertible. So that's saying that a, that's saying that pi inverse times pi a v is equal to pi inverse of zero, pi inverse times zero. Anything times the zero vector is zero. So pi inverse pi a v is equal to the zero vector. But pi inverse pi is the identity matrix. So pi AV is zero with the identity matrix times A being A. So the identity matrix is like the number one. And so what's, what's happening here, you know, in some rough description is, is you're seeing an explanation in matrix terms of why elementary row operations don't change a solution space. We're calling the solution space for homogeneous equations a null space but the idea 
The idea is that the various row operations, when you configure them as left multiplication by elementary matrices are reversible, you can reduce the matrix A by, by successively multiplying it by some invertible, invertible matrices, you get a formula for U in terms of A. And we're using that relationship between A and U, the fact that it's, it's, it's a reversible relationship in order to show that the null space of A and the null space of U are the same guy. That's an important fact because what that's saying is that if you know the null space of U, which is much easier to compute, then you already know the null space of A because they're the same thing. Um, so right now, 1201, I think I'll end on that note. Um, all we're really saying now is that there's a way to write down pretty, in, in some decisive way, a basis for the null space of a matrix A. You do it in the way that you think. You solve some associated system of equations. And because everything that you're doing in order to reduce the matrix is reversible, the null space of the reduced matrix and the null space of A, they have the same null space. So there's no problem in looking at the null space of U. It's the same as the null space of A. Now, in the end, um, you know, we will have basis for something like the null space. There are a few other subspaces of RM that are worth talking about. The next major thing to discuss, I think, is the column space of A. Um, but we'll wind up waiting till, till Monday of next week to describe how you come up with the basis for that. Unsurprisingly, it, it has a lot to do with the fact that elementary row operations are invertible and the fact that formulas for reduced matrices, the fact that there's a formula which will give you the reduced matrix for A and A, you know, as, as some sort of equation. Um, so that's uh, all I really have to say today. There'll be an office hour at one as usual. Um, there are a couple of assignments due this week. I'm going to post written assignment two. I had to take the one I had down because I was not satisfied with it. Um, so I'm going to change it a little bit, remove some problems and maybe add others. Um, and then you can think about that for Monday. So um, if I see you today, that's great. If not, in office hours, maybe if not that, then maybe on Monday. Um, have a good day.